very much, Wolfgang, for the introduction. And in fact, you know, for inviting me here today, it's a great delight to be here at the conference uh, to interact with different people and to listen to all the you know, interesting presentation by different scholars. I've learned, learned a lot over the last one day. All right, so as uh, Wolfgang mentioned, I'm going to share a few perspectives uh, on enhancing biodiversity in the city-state of Singapore. Now, for, for those of you who are not familiar with Singapore, uh, it is a tiny island at the tip of the Malayan Peninsula, right? And how small we are, we are only 733 square kilometers, smaller than Berlin, but we have a population that is almost 2 million more than Berlin. Oh. Berlin. So as you can imagine, Singapore is a pretty dense city. Um, and as you can imagine too, therefore that Singapore is heavily built up, right? So this satellite image shows it very clearly. Perhaps about 70% of the land is now built up, but you can see, still see large swaths of green spaces in the central and the western part of Singapore. These are water catchment areas. And in the western part, it also includes the military training areas with some um, uh, agriculture land. Then on the satellite image, you can also make out that there are small patches of green. These are parks, nature reserve, and green open spaces. Right. So as you can also imagine that over the last uh, 200 years, uh, starting from the time Singapore was founded, the land cover has been transformed dramatically. So what was originally primary rainforest has been transformed. Uh, rainforest, mangrove, freshwater swamps has been reduced dramatically to a very small percent of the land now. And the uh, most part of the land is secondary forest, nature reserves and built up area. Now, despite all these uh, changes, uh, Singapore is still known as an unusually green city. Now, why do I say that? Now, generally, we know that there's an inverse relationship between vegetation in the city and population density, right? And you can see from the graph here, uh, plotted using Greenview Index, Singapore is unusual because it is way above the median mm. in terms of its Greenview Index. And you get the same results more or less when you plot it with uh, vegetation cover or tree canopy cover, right? So it's unusual. Now, this obviously didn't happen by chance. And to me, this is an outcome of focusing on greening as a cornerstone of a Singapore's development approach for more than 60 years. And this started more than 60 years ago. And over time, we have given uh, different names to the city that you know, carry that green city ideal, uh, different names, different metaphor, they have different aspirations. So we started off with a garden city and then transform it to a city and garden, and so and so forth. And now we call ourselves a city in nature. Mm -hmm. right. Right, but obviously the land cover in cities are not static, they are dynamic, they keep on changing, right? So how would land cover change and how would land cover affect biodiversity in the city? That's the main question, right? And the graph here uh, is someone, something that adapted from a colleague, a colleague, Richard Collett, um, who was very prescient in predicting what would be the land cover in, in Singapore going forward. So you can see here that within 200 years or 100 years, uh, from the time Singapore was founded by the British, we have practically lost all our primary rainforests. That happened because the land was converted or forest was cleared for cash crops, cultivation, for agriculture. Now, over time, soil fertility dropped, the crops were abandoned, uh, or it's also because the economic prices of certain crops dropped, um, and they were also hit by pests and diseases. And when the land were abandoned, secondary forests came, right? Um, and over time, as the urban population increased, or human population increased, urban settlements increase, and therefore the urban area now increases. Right. So if you look at the current situation now, there are actually only two major land cover classes in Singapore, secondary forests and urban land area. And it's quite obvious that going forward, we will have less secondary forests because of development, but we're going to have more urban green spaces. That's the prognosis for, for Singapore going forward. And the question we ask are, what are the consequences for biodiversity in the city? And how might we mitigate such possible impacts of changes? Right, so that sets the context for, for the talk. Uh, and I've broken down the, the sections into three parts. Uh, the first part, I, I discuss and I share my views on what we should do, taking a look at a half full or half empty approach and this is borrowing from uh, Collett again, who wrote about it in 2013. Then I'll share about strategies uh, that have been adopted in Singapore for enhancing urban biodiversity. 
then I'll wrap up with uh, some of my own perspective of what we should do in cities. And I've given a list of references. Uh, some of the top things I'm sharing has been written. And, and if you're interested, you can read more about this in the, in the publications I've listed. Right, so this is how Singapore is in a full state. Um, you can imagine the luxuriant vegetation. This is from a lithograph that was done by an Austrian diplomat and naturalist. It's, it's quite remarkable in terms of details. Um, and it showed the luxuriant vegetation that has also been described by travelers when they came to Singapore. For instance, William Jack in 1819, when he came to Singapore with uh, Stanford Raffles, who founded Singapore, and who later claimed Singapore as a colony of the British Empire. Right? And he drop, wrote about the luxuriance of the tropical vegetation and so, so forth. Now, interestingly, uh, Alfred Wallace, and you may know that Alfred Wallace at the same time, together with Charles Darwin, developed a theory of evolution. And Alfred Wallace visited Singapore a couple of times, and he wrote about his efforts in being able to collect 700 species of beetles within one square mile of a forest. That's really remarkable, right? But at the same time as this was happening in other parts of Singapore, destruction of the forest was taking place. So this is again another little graph by the Austrian diplomat von Rensenet, and he was trying to depict the forest fires that had been started to clear the forest for cultivation of crops. He captured that in this little graph, right? And Alfred Wallace, at the same time in other parts of Singapore, wrote about this, that once the forests are cleared, he couldn't find much in terms of flora and fauna, obviously. Right, so now Singapore from a full state has moved on to a half empty state because we have lost more than 99% of this original vegetation cover. Now you can imagine that there is therefore immense consequences for biodiversity loss. Right, and it is only in more recent years that ecologists have begun to put a number to this. So this is one of the earlier papers and it wrote that you no, know, the Species extinction in Singapore for butterflies, fish, birds, and mammals uh, was someone in the range of 34 to 87%. Uh, this is on bats. So species extinction range from 33 to 72% of species of bats. This is a more recent one, uh, 2020, uh, published in 2020, that says that about 50% of all butterflies in Singapore has been extirpated. Right, so, so we've such um, alarming and I think to a large extent depressing results from ecologists. Um, and given that you no know, Singapore will continue to have challenges in balancing competing land use needs, how should we approach biodiversity conservation in Singapore? Bear in mind that we're just a tiny island. We could take a half empty approach. This is doom and gloom, is resignation and inaction because everything is lost. Right, or it's going to be lost fully in the future. Or do we take a half full approach? We try to be optimistic, we'll persist and we'll try. I think by and large, Singapore has taken a half full approach. I think there are two main reasons. The first is that even though we have lost so much biodiversity, uh, Singapore has been described to be stunningly rich in native biodiversity for a tiny island. And we have, for instance, about more than 2000 species of vascular plants native. We have about 400 plus species of birds. And I, I understand that this is actually not far away from the total bird species in Europe, which is around 500 species. So we have 400 species on a tiny island, right? So Singapore is really biodiverse and, and the numbers are there. Now, the second reason uh, why we want to take a half full approach is that I think we begin to realize that nature can be more resilient than we expect. And therefore it is natural for us to do what we can to create favorable environment uh, as habitats for biodiversity and to build on successful cases. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of successful cases in Singapore in terms of biodiversity conservation. Now, the first one, otters, the smooth coated otters, uh, still critically endangered. It was last sighted in the mid 1990s and for 30 years before that, it was not seen in Singapore. And it was, even when it was sighted in 1990s, it was more or less uh, restricted to the nature reserve, which is a wetland reserve. But by now, Singapore has about 150 individuals that are roaming throughout Singapore in different families. Uh, this got um, people interested. BBC came to cover this. Um, National Geographic did a story on this in Singapore. 
and it was narrated by David Attenborough. Remarkable. Right? And you can see the, the authors in Singapore roaming about in a highly urbanized setting. So we say that this family of authors is probably the most urbanized authors in the whole world. <laughs> right? um, and the World Bank wrote a blog about this. So he asked in 2017, was this a fad? I think he got it wrong. It is not a fad. Five years later, Singaporeans are still fascinated with authors. But the World Bank asked, was this a big deal? And he said, absolutely, and I fully agree. Um, as an officer in the National Parks Board years ago, when this was emerging, I personally didn't feel that we would have a chance of supporting a population of authors in urban Singapore. And it was proven wrong. And the authors are much more resilient and adaptable than what I expected. Um, and obviously, having uh, authors in a city um, means that we have to be tolerant of their presence. Authors are jaywalkers. Right? You can see them here, uh, right outside the office of the prime minister and the president, uh, crossing a road with no regard to traffic lights. The police officer had to stop the traffic for them to cross safely. Um, and, and Singaporeans, by and large, are still fascinated with authors. So in 2016, when they were asked to, to vote for a mascot for the National Day, Singaporeans voted for the authors. And, and I will talk more about this point about the power to use authors for environmental education later on. Now, the second example that I like to cite is uh, this straw-headed baobu. This is a lovely bird prized for its songs uh, and is found, found in Southeast Asia naturally. Um, but the species has gone extinct in Thailand. Population is collapsing in most parts of Indonesia and, and Malaysia. But this study showed that uh, Singapore's population of Stroy Babu is increasing. And, and when this was done in 2017, Singapore holds more than one third of the global population of Stroy Babu. Now, a lot of critics about biodiversity conservation in Singapore will ask, what's so special about the biodiversity in Singapore? Because what we can find in Singapore, we can find the region generally. But this example illustrates quite well that if we have not done our conservation measures in Singapore, right, and when the surrounding population collapses, this will be the last time you're going to see this species on Earth. So conservation in Singapore could matter for that reason. Now, another example is a bird. This is the uh, oriental pipe oriental hornbill. Uh, it was rated as extinct from mainland Singapore. And in fact, it was last recorded by Wallace in 1855, years ago. Then it was cited in mainland Singapore, an island of Singapore in 1994. And we decided to do a project called the Singapore Hornbill Project, where we created artificial nest boxes for them in mainland. And the population is now growing. And it's more than 60 birds by now. Right. And this is a scene uh, out from my balcony where I stay. And you can imagine this is a high rise environment. I, I put this picture here because I would regularly wake up to the calls of hornbill in this environment. So hornbills has also become adapted to the urban environment in Singapore, and they're able to forage for food because of the vegetation that we've introduced into the urban areas. Now, um, it's beyond the, the animals. Uh, this is an example of uh, macro fungi, uh, Aminita sculpta, that was not cited in 80 years. But remarkably, we found it in the uh, forest and slightly where it was first discovered by Corner, who was one of the assistant directors of Singapore Botanic Gardens. Um, amazingly, we're still discovering new species. This is named after Singapore, Nervilla singaporensis. Not only is it a new species that was discovered two years ago, we believe this is endemic to Singapore. Right, and, and there are other good news. So while I said that the butterfly population has collapsed or we have lost about 50%, but this recent study showed that actually the discoveries of new species or rediscovery of species has gone up. And that is in attendant with the increase in urban vegetation cover, right? This was a adaptation of the figure that I showed just now. And the authors attributed it to possibly habitat recovery, improved habitat connectivity, lower undetected undetect extirpitations or lengthening of the extinction depth. These are possible reasons, but it's good news, right? So, and, and this pet, uh, um, segment over here illustrate that, you no, know, we have had a lot of species discovery and rediscovery over the last couple of years. And therefore the half full perspective lead us to conclude 
that nature can be more resilient than we expect uh, and continued monitoring would quite often give us some surprising and happy news. And I'd like to attribute this in part to um, some of the conservation biodiversity or conservation strategies that have been adopted in Singapore. And, and this is what I'm going to cover now. Um, I start off with this framework. Now, this is nothing new. It's something that I wrote about in a chapter, which I also adapted from colleagues Amy Haas and Mark McDonald. Now, essentially, the, the diagram if it, it says that for biodiversity conservation to be successful, you have to apply different strategies that is catered for different spatial scale. Right? So at a town scale or regional scale, you should be looking at a top-down helicopter approach to look at developing a network that can support the biodiversity. And obviously, you have to identify and protect the core areas of biodiversity. Right? At the same time, you know, when you look at um, areas that are degraded, you um, implement re ecological restoration, you enhance landscape connectivity. So these are actions they will take at a slightly larger spatial scale. Now, the moment you go to a site or block scale, um, then obviously the strategies switch to creating diverse habitats at a kind of scale and increasing species diversity whenever you new implement a green space within the city. Right? This is not the kind of framework that's adopted officially, but I, I use this to illustrate the strategies that have been, that have been adopted in Singapore. Right, so the first strategy is to develop an island-wide ecological network. Um, and this was uh, just reported in the media in August 2021, just last year. And essentially, we have developed an ecological network for the whole of Singapore uh, using least cost path modeling for a couple of taxonomic species or taxonomic groups. Um, and essentially, what then was done was that with that least cost path model built, we overlaid onto that plan green spaces that have been secured or green spaces that are parkland to identify areas where we can intensify the habitat uh, restoration and also to identify gaps where we can adopt different measures to close some of the areas which are not well connected right so at the whole island scale there's now a spatial plan to guide biodiversity conservation efforts at the planning level now, the second measure is to protect and strengthen the core areas. That's logical. We protect areas with still very, with high uh, conservation value. Uh, and these are naturally the na uh, nature reserve, but they also extend beyond the nature reserve into you know, the surrounding islands uh, for marine biodiversity, as well as in the Western catchment that's still relatively untouched. Now, what do we mean by safeguarding? So one method is to secure and enhance the uh, buffer areas. And I, I read the document, uh, the 10 knows. Is that the 10 to know? Uh, 10 must know. 10 must know, okay, I read that. And I was pleasantly you know, um, uh, uh, delighted to see, to see that there's also a recommendation that we need to create buffer areas around the protected areas, yeah. right? This is exactly what we have been trying to do in Singapore. So these are in the form of nature parks, they are not gazetted as nature reserve, but they are nature parks that we can identify to create. And, and they're created around the nature reserve for two reasons. The first reason is obviously to re reduce the age defects going to the interior. And the second reason is to draw people who are so interested in visiting nature reserve into the nature parks. So this is what has happened at the Central Catchment Nature Reserve. And this is what is going to happen in another nature reserve called the Sungai Bulo Wetland Reserve. Right, and nature parks are going to be created around it to support and protect the nature reserve. Right, um, the third strategy is habitat enhancement and uh, species recovery. And I draw an example from the Singapore Botanic Gardens. Right, so this is a, a piece of land that we were given more than 10 years ago. Um, and this is the stretch over here. When it was given to us, it was uh, predominantly a degraded forest, scrubland with a lot of exotic species. So one obvious strategy was to remove the exotic and sometimes invasive species and plant back the native species, right? The second strategy is that you now when we look at historical maps, which is this area over here, we noticed that there was a wetland. So when we went to the site, there was indeed a wet patch, but it was already quite degraded. So through ecological engineering, we recreated the wetland, right? This is a wetland that has been recreated and it's important because this wetland is now connected to our lake system that was already there. And together, they form 
the what the support the irrigation needs of this zone of the gardens in almost in 100%. So we are now totally dependent on the wetland for irrigation. Now this this has been pretty successful. Um, this is a restored wetland now, and I this is one of the, my most likable spots in the whole gardens. And we've introduced that, recreated the habitat that was there previously, introduced uh, more than 200 plant species. And also now we can find different aquatic animals that are found within the lake system. Now, um, even in parliament in Singapore, we talk about species recovery. So this is a quote. Uh, this is an answer that was uh, reported in parliament when a member of parliament asked about what are we doing about species recovery in Singapore. So the species recovery program has been ongoing, started in 2016. And from 2016 to 2021, we've increased the species recovery program from 46 to 120 species. And then by 2030, we would do that, uh, increase it further to 160 species. Uh, and, and over the years when we've been doing this, there's been some um, happy stories. So the Sunda slow loris, which was previously classified as critically endangered, has now been brought back to the level of endangered in Singapore. So earlier on, I've been primarily talking about protected areas and the parks. But you know, if you recall from what you see in the satellite image of Singapore, actually most of the action should be, in my view, taking place in the urban areas. Right? So this is an urban matrix. It makes sense for us to look at how we should introduce vegetation into the urban areas so that the vegetation can also support biodiversity. And a couple of ways of doing this. So the first one is Nature Way, and the second one is Park Connector, and I'm going to talk about this next. So Nature Ways are really just different way of planting the roadside planting verges. So this is a view of what, um, which is quite common in Singapore. The canopies of trees have been planted along roads are merging. I, I guess in, to some extent, uh, maybe in 20 years time, you can't really see the road carriageway from the top in many parts of Singapore. Right? And, and more than 90% of roads have, have been planted with trees in Singapore. And the question we ask is that for the same planting area that has been used for planting trees, can we create a different kind of planting concept and use the roads which are pervasive in Singapore in most cities as linear connectors for biodiversity? So this is a concept. This is the original tree that's on the road. Uh, and usually they are well spaced at regular distance. Now we introduce emergent tree species from forests that will punch above the canopy. So that will form the emergent layer. And under the canopy, we put shrubs, a shrubbery layer, as well as ground cover layer to try to mimic the kind of structure they find in the forest. And these are examples of um, nature ways that have been planted. Uh, and, and there's a large target has been set to increase the nature way planting in Singapore. Now the second one is a park connector. They are usually not along the roadside. The park connector is actually a system of linear parks that you can see here that I have been planned uh, around the whole Singapore. And eventually, I think by 2030, we should have 500 kilometers of this throughout Singapore, right? And the idea is therefore, can park connector be planted to support biodiversity for movement throughout Singapore? Not many studies on this, but this is one of the rare studies that was done to look at the biodiversity that can be sited along park connectors. And indeed, this study showed that you still can record a pretty high biodiversity along park connector. And this picture shows birders trying to catch pictures of, of an eagle that's nesting on this tree along a park connector. Right? And obviously, there are different um, requirements for this to be achieved. And one of them is to protect the area that are just adjacent to the park connector. Now, the other main component of the urban metrics, obviously, is the, the buildings. Right? So this is a building. You may not see it, but this is actually a big, a large building that have been planted with vegetation on different levels. I guess in, in maybe 10 years' time, you will not be able to make out the building outline easily. But um, this is what is happening in Singapore. There is a big movement to promote vegetation on buildings. And this was done by an independent group uh, uh, in which they do did a biodiversity survey. And in this environment, they recorded 50 animal species, including mammals, birds, and butterflies, 
And the study reported that this is actually higher than in the adjacent park near the area or near the building. Um, this is an example of how vegetation has been introduced in buildings. This is a hospital, a Kotekpat hospital. In fact, I, I always uh, um, tell my, my friends who visit that if you don't look at the doctors and the nurses in their uniform, once you enter the building, you don't really think that it's a hospital. Um, it is planted with vegetation at all levels, with aquatic systems, and it was reported that there are 100 species of fishes, 24 species of dragonflies, um, 60 species of butterflies, and 66 species of birds have been recorded. It's quite amazing. And obviously, uh, we also know that the um, vegetation and the greenery around hospital could have some effect on patient recovery, right? And for that reason, this, this project also won the first uh, annual Stephen Kellett Buffalo Design Award. Right, so I have given a, a range of examples of, um, of uh, strategies that are used in Singapore for biodiversity conservation. And I'll now wrap up to, to share a few perspectives of what we can do, right, for, for cities in general. Uh, the first obvious one to me is that I, I strongly encourage people to look at it from a half full perspective. Now, for sure, we will continue to have biodiversity loss in Singapore. We will lose some, but I think we also win some. Uh, and we tend to lose more if we don't try to try to conserve this. Now, so, so what if we still have an extinction debt? Um, but if we ex extend and prolong the extinction debt, this is also good news for us, right? Um, and the kind of half full perspective in my view is helpful to cultivate a community, community of scientists, policymakers, and citizens who are passionate about biodiversity. I think we are on that journey in Singapore. And I quote a colleague who, who uh, first introduced the half full or half empty perspective. And he says that if Singapore plays it cuts right, we'll still be a half full a century from now. That's remarkable, right, for a city state like Singapore. Now, the second um, point that I'd like to highlight is that um, the impacts of the city in terms of biodiversity conservation extends beyond its boundary, right? So, so no city is an island, no ecosystem is an island. Even if we are an island, we are part of an interconnected system. Um, and so a regional international perspective is useful. And I use this example of biodiversity hotspots as an illustration of why it matters for biodiversity conservation in a tiny island of Singapore, because we're part of that Sunda region, which is classified as a major biodiversity hotspot. Um, I'll use this example to illustrate why it's important. So this, is a, uh, uh, this shows how we have been tagging migratory shorebirds to, that come to Singapore um, over the years. This is a program that has started in 1990 using different standard international methods. Over the years, we have progressed, and the latest is to use satellite tracking um, on the birds. And there's some interest, interesting results that come up from this, right? Now, for, for a long time, uh, this is where Singapore is. We have always taught ourselves that we are part of the East Asian, Austral East Asian Australasian flyway for birds in migratory patterns for shorebirds. Um, and our results show that actually Singapore is at the confluence of the East Asian Australasian flyway over here, together with the Central Asian flyway. And this is the evidence we have, right? So we track the birds and, and we track how they move from Singapore, predominantly on the East Asian Australasian flyway, right? But we found that the birds were flying through the Himalayas to the Central Asian flyway. This was news to us. And the birds start to return in some parts of the year. Right. right. We know exactly where they are over this period of time of tracking. Right. So the point, and this has been published uh, just recently in scientific reports. So the point here is that no, um, Singapore is connected to other parts of the world by the birds. Right. And it matters for us to continue to safeguard the nature reserve, which is an important stopover, a pit stop for the birds in coming, to, flying through this pathway. Not just one pathway, but two pathways. 
right? Um, and this is an example that I, I cited just now, the straw-headed bulbu. Um, so it's no, no longer safe to assume that a non-endemic species lost from Singapore will still persist elsewhere in the region, which is why conservation is important in Singapore to the rest of the world. Now, this is another example. It's quite dated, but I thought I'll, I'll use this example to illustrate that you no know, conservation in Singapore may matter to humanity in a larger scale. Right? So this was done uh, by, this was reported by botanists in, in Harvard. Uh, they were looking at a species called Califylum that apparently has an extract that could stop HIV AIDS. Right? But when they went back to the forest where it was found in Borneo, the forest has been cleared. The species is gone, right? They then contacted their counterparts throughout the world, including the Singapore Botanic Gardens. And we found the species they were looking for in the small primary forest that had been safeguarded in the Botanic Gardens, mm. right? So the point here is that, no, we do not know what exists in, the, in our forest system. That one fine day, there could be something that we discover that could be of huge importance to humanity. Um, and the fourth or the third point here is the importance of science and biodiversity monitoring. Um, I wrote a, a chapter to this uh, FAO publication called Forests and Sustainable Cities. And inside here, I wrote about the importance of um, knowing what to conserve starts, or biodiversity conservation starts with knowing what we have to conserve, right? So monitoring is of critical importance. I do not think that we have been in this favorable state if not for the resources that we've been investing in policy monitoring. Right? It's important to know what to conserve, what are the impacts of the strategies, and also to develop a science-based approach to policies formulation for conservation. Um, just show you examples of um, what we have been doing when we talk about monitoring. Right? This is um, refers banded langur, quite, quite endangered in Singapore. And we constructed rope bridges to see whether or not it's crossing between two forest fragments. Obviously, it works, right? And there are other animals that we're monitoring with our camera traps. So the whole central catchment has been installed with a couple hundred of camera traps in the nature reserve. And, and the outcome of this is that it gives us information about species status. So this is a, a work that has been published recently. The camera traps tell us that the population of the lesser mouse, mouse deer has been stable despite the increase in the wild wild population and the sample deer population. That's important because the lesser mouse deer, mouse deer is an endangered animal in Singapore. Right, and I should also talk just briefly about the handbook on uh, Singapore Index for city, uh, Cities. Uh, this was developed with the CBD more than 10 years ago um, and, and still used and promoted for cities to adopt, to monitor their biodiversity, right? And, and finally, the last point I want to make is that there's a need to continue to engage multiple stakeholders. So on the right over here, you see the Singapore Green Plan that was formulated just uh, um, late last year or early this year, which defines Singapore's aspiration to continue sustainable development to fulfill some of the obligations uh, of Singapore. And one of the key things in the Singapore Green Plan is the effort about greenery and conservation in the city among five or four other different categories. So nature in the city has been captured in the National Green Plan for 2030. And this would not have happened without engagement. Um, and it also shows that at the national level, there's a recognition of the value of greenery to a city. And this did not come by chance. This is years of work. So for 10 years, we've been doing festival of biodiversity to get general population to be aware of the, what we are doing, the importance of conservation, and to get politicians on board to, to share with us or share with us citizenry, the messages of biodiversity conservation. Um, and last, I will end up with uh, talking about authors. Hmm. Um, Someone wrote this article in an online media, what's with the absurd Singaporean obsession with authors. Um, so there are groups of people in Singapore capturing pictures of authors and posting on Facebook. So this is one example, Monday Blues, you're not alone. Right? The authors have Monday Blues, right? And there are a lot of these kind of pictures are posted and people feel that this is obsessive. I think it's a good thing. I, I believe that the authors is a remarkable opportunity for us to use 
in environmental education. Now, the authors who have not thrived in Singapore, if not for the clean environment, it's not possible for them to survive in the urban areas with no food, right? So it encouraged us to believe, to, to want to continue to protect the environment and creating pro environmental behavior. It fosters that connection uh, with nature, which is so important in the city, to counter what is known as the nature deficit in cities. And it also helped us to promote the idea of coexistence of with nature, even in a city environment, right? Um, I still have a couple of minutes. I'm, I'm going to continue to summarize. So, so Singapore is surprisingly green and biodiverse. It, it's remarkable. Um, I say that not because I'm a Singaporean, but I really believe that we've done quite a lot of interesting work. Um, it has some losses, but it also has some wins. And I can attribute it to the resilience of nature towards disturbances, the high level of monitoring that's taking place, the conservation and environmental improvement measures that have been put in Singapore that has been built upon a long history of urban greening. Now, without that effort to green the city in the earlier years, we could not have done what we have been observing today. So um, the strategies have been adopted across multiple scales. Um, the, the, point, the other point to make is that the future of species persistence is not guaranteed, right? But I think it's brighter compared to a situation when no measures are taken. Why right. um, multiple measures and approaches can be taken, but they all would involve engagement and partnership across citizens, scientists, and policymakers. Right. That's all I have to share. So I hope that this has been useful and interesting to you. Thank you.